are in 2 Chronicles. Chapter 21. Now where we left off last week, things were looking good for the southern kingdom of Judah. Jehoshaphat had been a good king, a little distracted at times, and in the case of the high places, uh, lacking in follow-through. But overall, he had sought to honor and serve the Lord by being a godly king, like his father Asa. And he brought religious and judicial reform to the kingdom. So we, la- we wrapped up last week with the first verse of this chapter, which better belonged to chapter 20. That verse reads, Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. Then Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. Um, most scholars date his reign from 872 to 848 B.C., Um, Jehoshaphat became king in the 38th year of his father's 41-year reign. So some of his years, um, or I'm sorry, uh, Jehoram, uh, some of his years uh, were ruled concurrently with his father. Um, So um, Jehoshaphat himself, he never waged war with the ten northern tribes. In fact, he made peace with them through marriage. But God wasn't happy with Jehoshaphat's agreements with wicked kings such as Ahab and Ahaziah. So he warned Jehoshaphat through a prophet, Yehu, who told the king, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Therefore, the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Nevertheless, good things are found in you in that you have removed the wooden images from the land and have prepared your heart to seek God. Sometimes those things that we do as adults, we should not do, um, or or which we don't do, um, end up causing problems in the lives of our children. Um, I'm not speaking of generational curses here. Um, this this idea, which is uh, improperly applied today and, and used by um, charlatans, I hate to hate to use the word, but really it is. Um, it, they use it to to really just kind of leech riches out of gullible Christians. Um, a generational curse was a consequence for a specific nation, for Israel. Um, for a specific sin, idolatry. Clearly, we see this in Exodus 20. The Old Testament, especially Judges, contains the record of this divine punishment coming upon generations and generations of Israelites. The cure for that generational curse was not casting out a demon of this or that. It was repentance. So, not generational curses, but I'm talking this morning about learned behavior repeated by the children. Children learn from their parents. They learn obedience, they learn disobedience, they learn rebellion. Ungodly parents will put rebellion in the hearts of their children. Jehoshaphat was an idolater. And uh, was not, he was not an idolater. Neither was Asa, but um, Jehoram was an idolater. And Jehoram would have seen his father teaming up with wicked King Ahab and with Ahaziah and participating with wickedness becomes that slippery slope into idolatry. Today with chapter 21, the kingdom of Judah suddenly appears um, into a very dark time. Uh, that dark time, the reign of, of Jehoram and Ahaziah and their sequel in Athaliah's overthrow and death, these brought the nation to, to the brink of internal destruction. The great cause was the, was the influence of, of the wicked house of Ahab. It was Jehoshaphat himself that introduced this influence. The disastrous nature of his alliance with Ahab had been forecast by the prophet Yehu. And here in this chapter, we find those consequences unfolding. Like much of what we have here in 2 Chronicles, there is template text that we find in Kings. Um, Ezra, the author of Chronicles, used Kings as his furlaga, um, but Ezra wrote for a purpose that necessitated a focus on the southern kingdom. And so we have in Chronicles more information about the southern kingdom 
than we find in kings about the southern kingdom. So in our text today regarding Jehoram, we have several additions to what we would find in the template text of 2 Kings 8. And the key changes are in reference to references to the Davidic covenant and prophetic judgment against Jehoram. This means Ezra creates in this text an emphasis on God's involvement with his people as they pass through these troubled times. Um, he says through this that they can be assured that God remains totally committed to his promises and that he deals severely with individual rulers who deny the very covenant that brought them to power. This was most certainly a couple of things that these returning exiles who would have been the ones who were reading what Ezra was writing needed very much to be reminded of. These were a useful truth. And perhaps a greater perspective, the useful truth for us today, becomes that evil is ultimately a passing phenomenon because God stands unconditionally by his word. For both both uh, post-exilic Israel as well as for us today, there was and there is this call to perseverance and dependence on God's faithfulness, just as the prophets and the godly leaders had shown. And for us today, the experience of the cross shows that relief from evil is absolutely certain, though it does not necessarily happen <laughs> quickly. The cross is a sign of God's ultimate commitment. So that whether persecution leads to life or death, his people cannot be separated from the promises of his eternal covenant. Jehoram's name means the Lord is exalted, which seems to bear its own irony in that Jehoram was not a king who exalted the Lord in his life. But the truth of the matter is that the Lord is and the Lord will be Exalted. He will be exalted whether a person, a people, or a nation chooses to participate or not. Let's pray, and then let's dig into our chapter for this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for each person that you have brought here this morning. We thank you that you know each of us by name. Lord, we open up your word together as a congregation desiring to hear from you, not the words and the wisdom of a person, a man, but your words and your wisdom. We ask, Lord, that you would soften our hearts that we would receive from you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So starting in verse 1, the text of our chapter reads, And Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, Then Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. He had brothers, the sons of Jehoshaphat, Atzarhiah, Yahiel, Zechariah, Azariahu, Mikael, and Shephatiah. All these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. Their father gave them great gifts of silver and gold and precious things with fortified cities in Judah. But he gave the kingdom to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. Now when Jehoram was established over the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself and killed all his brothers with the sword and also others of the princes of Israel. So Jehoshaphat has died. And after him, his son, Jehoram, ruled in his place. 2 Kings 8 tells us <coughs> that he was 32 when he became king, and he ruled for eight years. We're also told that there in, in 2 Kings that he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, just as Ahab had done. And the daughter of Ahab, we know, was his wife. Now, children in Scripture were considered to be indications of God's blessing. And Jehoshaphat had seven sons mentioned here in the text. Indications of blessing are also implied in the mention here of the wealth in silver and gold, and also the fortified cities. Jehoshaphat had given each of his sons a fortified city to rule. Now, given that these were fortified cities, 
This may have been to prevent the cities from uh, attacking one another. Um, It also guaranteed that these cities would remain loyal to the king. So there was some strategy as well behind this. This much family thought of as a blessing, only Jehoram didn't see his brothers as blessings. He saw them as threats. And verse 4 tells us that Jehoram had all of his brothers killed along with some of the other officials of Israel. Ezra's tone in regards to this is, as you would expect, negative. It was treachery. And these acts of treachery and violence all fall under the broad category of strengthened himself. It's a subtle way of saying that he got rid of anyone who might have laid claim to the throne or that might have been a threat to his rule. So it may have been the case that Jehoshaphat had designated Jehoram as his successor only because this was his firstborn son, not because this was his godly son, certainly, or that this was the one that he even desired to to take the throne after him. So in this list of brothers, we have two uh, uh, Atsaryahs, one Atsaryah and one Atsaryahu. These are the same name. Because kings in this time did not typically have just one wife, this may indicate that each of the Atsar Yaz had a different mother. And this purging of other claimants to the throne would be something that we would perhaps more expect from one of the northern kingdom kings, not the son of godly Jehoshaphat of the southern kingdom. And yes, in doing this, Jehoram acted very much like the northern kingdom kingdoms, or the northern, northern kings. Nadab, in 1 Kings 15.29, he killed all of the house of Jeroboam. Uh, Zimri, in 1 Kings 16, it's recorded that he killed all the house of Baasha. But it's the first of several ways in which Jehoram acts more like uh, the, the wicked kings of the north rather than his godly father, uh, Jehoshaphat. And it shouldn't be forgotten that Solomon also Um, executed his own brother, Adonijah, who had sought to obtain kingship over united Israel while his father, uh, David, was on his deathbed. And of course, this isn't the last of this kind of thing that we'll see in Judah. So fear of having his rule challenged was an issue, but there may have been something else at work here. Jehoram, as we find out, was a Baal worshiper. So it may have been that he sought to model his rule after that of Ahab and Jezebel and feared his brothers would oppose him um, and and oppose his promotion of this Baal worship. Now, I mentioned that 2 Kings 8 gives a brief overview of Jehoram's reign, but verses 2 through 4 of our text here has no match of its own in Kings. This text was probably copied Uh, by Ezra from some other official record. There is evidence in that text of Ezra putting his own thoughts into it. Um, We can tell from the vocabulary, such as um, Jehoshaphat being called king of Israel, um, because the chronicler regarded the kingdom of Judah as being the true Israel. Now let's read on verse 5. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab had done. For he had the daughter of Ahab as a wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Yet the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David. And since he had promised to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. In his days, Edom revolted against Judah's authority and made a king over themselves. Um, so we already pointed out Jehoram's age at the start of his reign, which would, this, his reign would have been somewhere between 848 and 841 BC. We also mentioned his marriage to a daughter of Ahab. I didn't mention the two contrasting covenants that we find spoken of in these verses. First of all, we have a covenant of marriage to Athaliah, daughter of Ahab. Marriage contracts in the ancient Near East were were known as covenants. In fact, in in political alliances, 
marriages were used as contracts between people groups. And in the case of our text, the agreement between Yoshphat and Ahab resulted in Yehoram doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. Secondly, there is the Davidic covenant here. God could have destroyed Yehoram, but instead invoked a greater covenant which he had made with David by the mention of his covenant and the phrase house of David instead of house of Judah. There's immediate notice made of this opposition between the house of David then and the house of Ahab. This covenant refers back to 1 Chronicles 17, verses 4 through 14. There, God, through the prophet Nathan, told David, Moreover, I declare to you that the Lord will build you a house when your days are fulfilled to walk with your fathers. I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. So the text here in our chapter, like in the Psalms and the prophets, speaks of the Davidic covenant in terms of God's unchanging and unconditional commitment to his people. The lamp that we have in verse 7 is also best understood in in, in the same way. It refers to God's unchanging faithfulness and thus permanence in contrast to the uh, lamp of the wicked which will be snuffed out. Proverbs 24.20 might be something that that you think about with this. There there will be no prospect for the evil man. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. Um, Of course, you also might think to Job 18, the light of the Excuse me, the light of the wicked indeed goes out, and the flame of his fire does not shine. Yes, God's people shine in the surrounding darkness, so there is, there is that kind of sense to this language here, but more so to our text, God is faithful to what he has promised, and he is worthy of every confidence. Now, back to the Davidic covenant, in addition to promising security for David's dynasty, the Davidic covenant also specifies that individual kings are to be punished for their waywardness. When King David addressed the leaders of Israel in 1 Chronicles 28, he also turned to Solomon. And to Solomon he said, As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. And God, spoke, God himself spoke to Solomon as recorded in Second Chronicles 7, verses 19 through 22, saying, But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot them from my land which I have given them. And this house which I have sanctified for my name, I will cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. As for this house which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done thus to this land and in this house? Then they will answer, because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who brought them out of the land of Egypt and embraced other gods, and worshipped them, and served them. Therefore he has brought all this calamity on them. Now, I want to take a second, I want to address the line that we read in 1 Chronicles 28, and the warning that David gave to Solomon. That line that I want to address is this, if you seek him, he will be found by you, but if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. It sounds terrible. And it is terrible, especially if we rip it out of its context and make it about eternal security or lack of. That text is not about that. This is specific to Solomon as king of Israel, to the kingdom of Israel, and specific to the physical earthly kingdom. If we include a few verses prior to that, then we find... Uh, that it says, It is your son Solomon who shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever if he is steadfast to observe my commandments and my judgments, as it is this day. Now, therefore, in all the sight of, of all Israel, the assembly of the Lord, and in the hearing of our God, be careful to seek out all the commandments of the Lord your God 
that you may possess this good land and leave it as an inheritance for your children after you forever. So you see, the broader idea is the earthly kingdom of Israel and her being established in the land. In fact, when we look at the, at the Hebrew, we find that the verb zanach um, is used in the sense of rejected and removed for the purpose of future restoration. The northern kingdom of Israel would first fall to the Syrians and they would be taken from the land. Then the southern kingdom of Judah would fall to Babylon and be taken from the land. And Chronicles was written by Ezra to those former exiles returning to Judah from Babylonian captivity. So you see, instead of uh, narcissizing uh, ourselves into this text, the text should be understood as intended. Otherwise, we could easily read something like this and, and conclude that there is no assurance for believers. And what a miserable life that creates where we have to hope that we have done enough good things to outweigh all the bad things that we've done. Now, that's a bit off the rails, of course, from our study, but I find this to be very important stuff. You're going to find day by day those who are um, within Christian circles who have a, a agenda of their own and, and want to keep you bound up in, in a lack of assurance in order that they can make use of you. And this is why I bring this up a lot, so that all of us are equipped. Be a Berean, investigate all things you read, all things you hear, all things that you are told, keeping God's word as your plumb and your measure. Now, back to our text and the Davidic covenant, the implications for your Horam are pointed out in two ways. Firstly, in a short passage that echoes text from Kings, which in, is verses 8 through the first part of verse 10, and then in material that's, that's unique to our chapter here in Chronicles, which we'll find in that second part of verse 10 and all the way then through uh, verse 19. So let's start with verse 8 here. In his days, Edom revolted against Judah's authority and made a king over themselves. So Jehoram went out with his officers and all his chariots uh, with him, and he rose by night and attacked the Edomites who had surrounded him and captains and the captains of the chariots. Thus Edom has been in revolt against Judah's authority to this day. At that time, Libna revolted against his rule because he had forsaken the Lord God of his fathers. <coughs> so first of all, we have an internal revolt by the Judean city of Libna. Um, the template text of Kings, which Ezra drew from, reads in this way. It says, In his days, Edom revolted against Judah's authority and made a king over themselves. So Yoram went to Zaire. Yoram and Yehoram are the same person. So Yoram went to Zaire and all his chariots with him. Then he rose by night and attacked the Edomites who had surrounded him and the captains of the chariots and the troops fled to their tents. Thus Edom has been in revolt against Judah's authority to this day and Libna revolted at that time. So Edom had probably been regained for Judah under Jehoshaphat, but when Jehoshaphat died and Jehoram was in power, Edom then set up its own king. Now, just so you remember, Esau was the father of the Edomites um, all the way from, from Genesis 36. At some point, Esau drove out the Horites and relocated his people to the mountains of Seir. Moses and the wandering Israelites, they encountered Edom um, as recorded in Deuteronomy. Uh, the books of Joshua and Judges then make no mention of interactions between Israel and Edom. But Saul, David, and Solomon each engaged with Edom. David completely subdued Edom. But during the reign of Solomon, the struggle between Edom and Israel began. And later, Jehoram, Amatzia, and Ahaz all had conflicts with Edom. Now, excavations at, at Edomite and Israelite sites indicate that the uh, Edomite civilization reached its peak somewhere between 800 and 600 BC. Uh, just to give you a broader perspective, this was a time when, when Homer of Greece wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, and the Assyrian army was beginning to make use of a process of making steel that would be suitable for weapons. Now, inscriptions in various places during this time um, have been found that warn of an Edomite attack. Um, they were been found in places like uh, Tel Arad, which is west of the Dead Sea and, and just east of Beersheba. 
Edom was located to the south of that area. So Libna, which was mentioned here also in this text, was an Israelite town that was in Judah. Um, they revolted because Jehoram had forsaken the Lord. Now it's generally believed that this revolt, revolt by, by Libna preceded Jehoram's trouble with Edom. Um, so the Edom revolt does not indicate a full-on invasion um, in which all of Judah was taken over by Edom. Um, rather, at some point after his troubles with Libna, uh, Jehoram found himself and his officers surrounded by an Edomite army, um, but they managed to escape. And as for details, very little is known, um, either about this revolt or, or, um, or of the, the trouble with, with Libna. Now, to this day in verse 10, is taken directly from 2 Kings 8.22. So it doesn't refer to Ezra's day in which he was writing this, but referred to the time when Kings was written. Obviously added as an explanation for the revolt. Now, what was more important to Ezra was that these events were symptomatic of the fact that Jehoram had forsaken the Lord. With Jehoshaphat, remember the key idea was seek the Lord. And now with Jehoram, the idea is that to forsake God is the opposite of seeking the Lord. Now, we already dealt with this version, uh, with a version of casting off. Um, but we're going to have to go a little bit deeper, I think, with this. There's a basic principle that is found in the Bible that God forsakes those who forsake him. Um, we find something very similar in the New Testament, um, only there it's put, uh, deny those who deny him. For instance, in Matthew 10.33 and in 2 Timothy 2.12, if we endure, <coughs> we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. But I think it's important that we get our vocabulary right in order to start out with this. Deny in Matthew and 2 Timothy is uh, the Greek word uh, arneomi, um, which is used in the New Testament to mean deny, reject, and refuse. The idea is that the denial of knowledge of or, or denial of relationship with or denial of a person or denial of an event. In the Greek version of the Old Testament, um, which is the Septuagint, we find this word actually used only once. And that's not here. That's in Genesis chapter 18, verse 15. Um, we don't find this Greek word used anywhere else in the Septuagint. The Hebrew word zanach, however, means rejected. So there are differences not just in language, but also in meaning and usage. And again, we should be very careful that we don't confuse what God's word teaches by conducting uh, a sloppy study. In other words, we should not conflate two different things because we notice words that mean slightly similar things and convey slightly similar ideas. It only takes one degree of error to take us 100 miles off of our target. 2 Timothy 2.12 was not intended to be taken alone. It is only part of a full expression from Paul. That full expression says, this is a faithful saying. If we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he, will, he also will deny us if we are faithless he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. When the New Testament speaks in regards to believers in such a way, if we deny him, he also will deny us. This is not speaking of eternal salvation being taken or snatched away from us. Nor is it speaking of forsaking in the sense of rejecting or being ousted from the kingdom. This is, a, this is speaking of being rewarded or not rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. Not, not the great white throne judgment. There's no losing of eternal life, but if we are unfaithful to the, to the Lord in life, we will lose rewards in heaven that we may have received had we been faithful. In the Old Testament, in regards to the Davidic covenant, which speaks of Israel and the Messiah coming through the Davidic line, we are, as we noted earlier, dealing with the physical, earthly kingdom of Israel. And even more specifically, the welfare of the king himself. But all of this written by Ezra was written to reassure his readers that God is faithful to his covenants. And he is going to prove himself to the world as faithful and just. Now, in our text, Joram is under judgment. 
Not eternal judgment. That would be reading more into the text than the text says. But earthly physical judgment because he has forsaken God. We see this judgment on a a macro level with the, the contrast between the two kingdoms. The northern kingdom is primarily pictured as uh, in the Bible is idolatrous and ruled by wicked and idolatrous kings, starting with uh, Jehoram. The southern kingdom is primarily uh, pictured in the Bible as godly with, with good kings. Um, uh, I, did I say Jehoram? Jeroboam, sorry. And thus the, the northern kingdom is pictured as, as suffering judgment because of their idolatry. And they are taken very quickly into captivity to the Assyrians, never to return. While the southern kingdom is prosperous and powerful, and when they're taken in captivity, they're eventually returned to the land by God. We see this from the very beginning of the divided kingdom with Jeroboam's persistence in rejecting God and and Rehoboam's humble repentance. That's a a macro kind of look at the the big picture. Of course, a a closer inspection as we're doing in our verse-by-verse study teaches us that even in the godly southern kingdom, there were some stinkers. And so Ezra identifies more of Jehoram's sins. Let's read on, verse 11. (coughs) Moreover, he made high places in the mountains of Judah and caused the inhabitants of Jerusalem to commit harlotry and led Judah astray. So the preceding Judean kings failed to, to follow through with removing these high places. But Jehoram was the first Judean king who actually built high places. In fact, it's probably Jehoram who constructed the Baal temple in Jerusalem that is torn down later in 2 Chronicles 23. There are two phrases that are somewhat common in the Old Testament. There's commit harlotry, mostly used in the prophets, and led astray, mostly used in the law. And these are both used most often to speak of idolatry. In fact, it was because they played a harlot with the gods of the people of the land that the northern kingdom went into exile. It's used here, uh, it's used here for shadows that the southern kingdom is going to befall that very same judgment. And with verse 12, we find that God responds to the actions of this wicked king and the people through prophecy. Perhaps because of the volatility of of this situation for prophets in in the northern kingdom, or because Jehoram was going the way of the northern kingdom, it may have also been that perhaps Elijah was just too old to travel. Um, Whatever the case, the prophet sends a letter to the king. And while we find Elijah throughout kings, this is the only appearance of Elijah in uh, Elijah the prophet in Chronicles. Um, he's only known to have prophesied in Israel, and there is no other known letter written by Elijah. Strangely, although he was certainly alive for a part of Jehoram's reign, he was also thought to have been dead by this time, which, if that's the case, means this letter itself was a prophecy. It just adds to just... It just adds just how amazing a prophet Elijah was. Now, today there are so many who claim to be prophets and also will then say that prophets can be wrong or kind of correct or nearly correct. And it's shameful. And if you listen to those kinds of hacks, then just stop it. Seriously. Uh, so we start with we start this letter with an indictment. The indictment essentially summarizes verses two through eleven. Let's read. And a letter came to him from Elijah the prophet, saying, "Thus says the Lord God of your father David, because you have not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat your father, or in the ways of Asa king of Judah, <coughs> but have walked in the way of the kings of Israel, and have made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to play the harlot." like the harlotry of the house of Ahab, and also have killed your brothers, those of your father's household, who were better than yourself. Behold, the Lord will strike your people with a serious affliction, your children, your wives, and all your possessions. And you will become very sick with the disease of your intestines until your intestines come out by reason of the sickness day by day. 
Moreover, the Lord stirred up against Jehoram the spirit of the Philistines and the Arabians who were near the Ethiopians. And they came up into Judah and invaded it and carried away all the possessions that were found in the king's house and also his sons and his wives, so that there was not a son left to him except Jehoahaz, the youngest of his sons. After all this, the Lord struck him in his intestines with an incurable disease. Then it happened in the course of time, after the end of two years, that his intestines came out because of his sickness. So he died in severe pain, and his people made no burning for him like the burning of his fathers, or burning for his fathers. He was 32 years old when he, came, when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem eight years and to no one's sorrow departed. However, they buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. So Elijah's letter starts by contrasting the ways of Asa and Jehoshaphat with the house of Ahab. And he did this to illustrate how Jehoram had betrayed his father, his father's father, and the people of the Lord, as well as, of course, the Lord. And then he goes on to the sins of idolatry and and fratricide. Jehoram captured and and killed the royal family. In fact, Elijah says those he killed were better than Jehoram. Better than you most likely means that Jehoram's brothers were not idolaters, but certainly that they were legally innocent and they were put to death without cause. Aside from the incident, or this, aside from this indictment, these first few verses of the letter emphasize that ultimate judgment belonged to the Lord. And that judgment we find to be in two parts. We find these in verses 14 through 15. In verse 14, we find there are consequences for the people. And Jehoram's sons and wives, they are singled out for special treatment. The people will suffer a serious affliction. That is a phrase that is nearly always associated with divine punishment. And that would come in the form of military defeat at times. Other times it would come in the form of a plague. Here the actual punishment is invasion by the Philistines and Arabians um, who were coming from a region near Cush, which we see in verse 16. And there we find that it was the Lord who stirred them up against Jehoram. Now, when the text says the spirit of the Philistines and the Arabians, it's not speaking of a a spirit or demon who inspired them or empowered them to attack. Rather, the idea is that the Lord aroused them to anger against Jehoram. Um, The Septuagint puts it this way. The Lord assembled against against Jehoram the foreigners and and the Arabs and the neighbors of the Ethiopians. Now, alternately... It may be that the Lord moved the invaders to come against Jehoram with the ferocity of the Philistines. But whatever the case, even in simple things, that, even in these kind of simple things, we just don't want to read beyond the intent of the text in order to preserve the meaning um, that was intended. Paul did allegorize, yes, Paul was also an apostle. Um, it's not proper for us to, to handle the text as if we ourselves are apostles. We are students, we are disciples. So we want to be careful, again, with the way that we understand the text here, that we do not put our own um, mind into it, but we instead seek the mind of God. So we have the indictment, we have the judgment, we, and the chapter ends with the fulfillment. Jehoram's murders are avenged, the, the king's house is looted, this was probably, <coughs> probably not a palace that was located in Jerusalem, as there would have been a, a greater plunder had Jerusalem been sacked by the Edomites, uh, or the, uh, uh, the forces here. Um, this king's house was probably just another smaller place, uh, another smaller palace location that was in one of these fortified cities we talked about before. And while his father dispersed his children and family to different fortified cities throughout Judah, it seems that Jehoram had taken a different approach and had all his family living in one place. Now, as a result of that, all his sons and wives were taken, except his youngest son, Jehoahaz, which was another name for Ahaziah. And it is Ahaziah um, who would rule after Jehoram for one year, but that's uh, for later on. 
Now, as for Jehoram himself, the second part of the judgment, the second part of Elijah's declaration befell him, and he became sick with a chronic intest, uh, intestinal disease. And indeed, um, as Elijah had said, his intestines are here reported to have come out. Um, one, one commentary I, I was reading, and I just couldn't leave this alone, because it was, I thought it was a terrible, a terrible uh, understatement. Um, it, it, it called this a very unpleasant disease of the bowels. Um, <laughs> so I was like, yeah, <laughs> no kidding. Not only was, was such a disease painful, but it would have been humiliating for the king and, and probably stomach turning for anyone who would have been around him. Um, we don't know exactly what this disease was. Um, it may have been a, a terrible chronic diarrhea that, that resulted in prolapse or um, it could have been some ulcers, or it could have been uh, resulted, you know, diarrhea resulting in dehydration, or it could have been a combination of all of the above. Um, but whatever it is, or it could have been a stomach wound that festered and got infected and festered for two years. But this was not the the last of the judgments. It's a terrible one, but it was not the last of them. The details of what became of his body after he died were also a part of of that judgment. Um, in fact, there were three additional negatives. First, that he was not honored with the customary funeral fire. Second, that there was no regret at his passing. And finally, that he was not buried in the royal cemetery. But the text itself here also ends with another insult toward, toward Jehoram. And that contrasts with the beginning of our chapter. In the front of our chapter, his godly father, it starts out and it says, and Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers. But we look down here, at the end of our chapter, we find no such statement. So Jehoram did not rest with his fathers. Let's stop here and, and pray. Lord Father, we thank you for this time that we have had together studying your word. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for who we are in you. Lord, we ask that your word would be made to prosper in our lives, to do those things that you desire for it to do. Um, help us to be devoted to you. Help us to be devoted to what you teach us through your word. And um, we thank you, Lord, that you love us so much. And we ask that, that you would uh, teach us to love the way that you love. That you would teach us to be compassionate toward one another. Teach us to be merciful. Lord, we ask that you would increase our love for one another. Establish us in all of your good things. All the, these wonderful fruits of the Spirit. Work in us those things that are pleasing in your sight. Lord, we ask that you would keep our hearts and our minds from evil. Protect us all from the deceptions of our enemy, the devil. We thank you that you are our Lord, you are our God. We place ourselves before you. We desire to please you with our lives, Lord. We thank you that, that when we are faithful, that when we serve you well, that it doesn't go unrewarded. Father, sometimes, yes, we receive blessings here, but greater are the blessings that are promised. Lord, we ask that you would lead us in victory. Use us to spread knowledge of Jesus Christ to all those who do not believe. Lord, we lift up those in this body who are sick and who are traveling. Ask, Lord, that you would heal the sick, that you would keep safe those who are abroad. May the Lord bless you, and may he keep you. 
May he make his face and his light to shine upon you and may he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua Mashiach, this Jesus the Messiah, our Lord and our Savior. Everyone said, Amen. The object of faith is not the gospel, my friend. The object of faith is Jesus. Being at peace with God is, is not automatic because you by nature are separated from God. The Bible says, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. You and I, we are both sinners. Every person is a sinner and sin, our sin, separates us from God. Sincerity, morality, good works, a religion. These are some of the ways that man has tried to close the gap between himself and God. Only God's love can close that gap of separation between himself and you. He paid the penalty for the sins of the world. The Bible says he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. But the good news is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as John the Baptist said, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Apostle reiterated this in 1 John 2, where we read this, And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Because of this, despite the fact that we are sinners, we are not blocked from God, and from his kingdom because of our sin. He has removed the sin barrier so that now we are all savable. All we need to do to have everlasting life with God, life that can never be lost, is to believe in Jesus Christ. As Jesus said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus very plainly says that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but has everlasting life. Because of the cross and the, the resurrection of Jesus, all who simply believe in Him have everlasting life and will one day be raised from the dead to live physically forever in perfect, glorified bodies. I can be absolutely sure that I have everlasting life because I know it has nothing to do with how good or bad I am and everything to do with Jesus' faithfulness to His promise. You crossed that bridge into God's family when you believe in Jesus Christ and God invites you to believe and freely receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life that can never be lost.